All that Jim and I ever did was make was do stuff that makes us laugh. Welcome to Shooting Stars, and without any further ado, let's meet our friend. What's going on? What are you doing? Yes, yes, welcome to Shooting Stars. <laughs> what they came up with was this format that totally showcased their own very unique uh, humour, um, but it had quite a rigid structure, so that even when they went off on a real flight of fancy, they could always come back to the quiz. And my first question in the true or false round goes to Charlie! <laughs> the guests were there just as sort of little pillars to hold up the, the show, and for Jim and Bob to beat the hell out of if and when they wanted. And it was hilarious. <laughs> After years of delighting and baffling audiences with their unique brand of humour, Vic Reeves and Bob Mortimer turned the traditional panel show on its head in 1995 when shooting stars hit Britain's TV screens. It's a bear! Over five series, they combined the surreal with slapstick, witty wordplay and schoolboy silliness. You didn't tune in for the Q&A, but to see Vic and Bob enjoying themselves and, in their unscripted way, somehow becoming the biggest, most influential double act of the 1990s. The story of shooting stars begins in late 1986. Bob Mortimer, on the outside a perfectly normal solicitor from Middlesbrough, is taken to Goldsmith's Tavern in South East London to see The Big Night Out, a Sunday variety show hosted by Darlington's Vic Reeves. Real name, Jim Moyer. Yes, thank you. The first time I, I saw or met Jim was a, a, a big night out in a room above a pub. And... Uh, I went there with a, a sort of mutual friend from Middlesbrough and uh, enjoyed the show very much. Zara, film producer David Lean is responsible for the Findus Range Lean Cuisine. You know, maybe it's because we're from the same region or whatever, but we both had the same sense of humour and we just got a night of house on fire. We were immediately best friends, I think. And we're going to applause from Captain Birdside! <laughs> What the dickens have you done with all those little children? <laughs> Jim would do a, a lot of characters on the live show, and at the beginning, anyone who was knocking around could come on and do something whilst Jim got changed. In sharp contrast to the anti-Thatcher political agenda dominating stand-up comedy at the time, Big Night Out was a bizarre mixture of Spike Milligan-esque surrealism and Eric and Ernie-style light entertainment. <laughs> It's always slightly mystified me that, that Vic and Bob were seen as this impenetrable, weird, surrealist act. And I think that was mainly a perception of, of Southerners. Northerners always accepted them as just a couple of funny guys. Right. There's a, I've seen it recently, not just on video, not on camera. I've actually seen policemen in their toques just squirting acid rain onto whales. <laughs> in tandem with the big night out, I was doing um, DJing at a club called Swag which was run by Adam Ross, who was Jonathan's brother. So Jonathan used to come down there, and I was kind of doing bits of the big night out in there. And, uh, so... Jonathan thought I was your boyfriend, didn't he? Did he? Mm. Well, you were, weren't you? Well, I was for a briefly, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, he used to come down. I mean, there's lots of people came down and word of mouth got out. Before we go any further, let's meet our Britain's top light entertainment, Mr Vic Greaves, ladies and gentlemen. Word around South London reached Jules Holland, who also became a fan. It led to Jim asking celebrities ridiculous questions for the first time on national television. Here's a question yeah. anyway. Right. Rod Stewart, the soccer mad nosy Parker of pop, has been married to an astonishing 370,000 women. <laughs> Jimmy, can you name them? I remember seeing him do a thing on uh, the Tube, I think it was. Very odd kind of daft game show thing he did. And I remember seeing that thinking, actually, no, it is quite funny, this. And I eventually went down to see uh, them do what was the last ever big night out in Goldsmith's Tavern when they were doing it just in a pub. Um, and I remember kicking myself, thinking, why didn't I go and see him before? Because he'd been doing it for a while by then. It was just the funniest thing I'd ever seen. By 1988, Jim's live show was so popular it moved to a bigger venue, the Albany Empire in Deptford. 
Devoted fans, including Paul Whitehouse and Charlie Higson, were able to come on and do a turn. They used to do a different two-hour show every week, so they needed a lot of other people to come in and do bits and pieces. And you'd turn up and he'd say, this is your costume, you've got to do this. You're a novelty act, um, a man with 20-foot-long trousers or something. With a cast of future comedy hotshots like Mortimer, Higson and Whitehouse, Vic Reeves' Big Night Out had become an underground phenomenon. And it attracted the attention of Alan Mark, producer for the independent TV company Channel X, whose frontman Jonathan Ross was another Vic Reeves fan. We made the um, pilgrimage down to Deptford to see Big Night Out, which is this kind of crazy show. Went on for hours. And he came out and did three Rod Stewart songs. Um, dressed in a suit made of horse brasses and we liked it so much we thought you know let's try and do something with this you know see if we could get it onto TV. Alan and Jonathan Ross helped give Jim and Bob exposure as TV performers providing regular cameos on Jonathan's chat shows. Big Night Out's big breakthrough came in 1990 when Seamus Cassidy at Channel 4 commissioned a series with Jonathan and Alan producing. But Jim and Bob were happy doing the live show, so those Channel 4 commissioners were just a little taken aback by the way the news was greeted. We went into Seamus Cassidy's office with Alan, Alan Mark took us in there, and, and uh, it was a, a case of, <coughs> we'd like to, <coughs> would you like to do a show on Channel 4? And uh, I said, how much do we get for it? Which wasn't really the thing that you're supposed to ask, I don't think. <laughs> Not since Spike Milligan's Q series had TV screened such a willfully odd show. Yet it was also strangely traditional, as Jim and Bob combined music, variety acts and physical comedy with what could only be described as performance art. Charlie Higson and Paul Whitehouse were around to help out, accompanied by some singing donuts. Big Night Out attracted a fanatical student fan base, and after series one, the show went on the road, turning Jim into an unlikely pop star. Well, I'm driving down the highway at the speed of light. We went off and did a university tour, which was, I think, really about 16 dates, and, uh, and it was, it was like being in a band. You had Ben Elton and people like that who were doing politics, but no one was doing music, so we, I ended up on the front of the NME. Then I did Born Free and ended up on Top of the Pops and that, was, that got to number three. So that sort of increased the pop fans. Then, I think there's another series of Big Night Out and then Dizzy. And Dizzy got to number one when we were at the Colston Hall in Bristol and it just went berserk and it was like, you know, we had um, girls and young boys screaming outside and barriers with people, you know, holding them back as they tried to tear our garments. But Reeves' mania and a cult TV hit weren't nearly enough for Jim and Bob, who now felt ready to try and come up with a new comedy vehicle. In 1992, they made Weekenders, a sitcom pilot co-starring future fast show regulars Simon Day and Paul Whitehouse. Channel 4 turned it down, but the boys just wouldn't let it lie. I know we haven't got a doorbell, but you could have knocked, couldn't you? No, I couldn't. We wanted to do a different show after the big night out, but um, Channel 4 wanted another big night out, and we, so the BBC said we could do what we, what we would like to do, and that was the smell of Reeves and Mortimer. The smell lingered on BBC Two between 1993 and 1995. It marked a further development in what Jim did best, mucking about behind a desk. And now Bob joined him there to help subvert and dismantle the elements of the standard light entertainment programme. Yes. Oh, mm -hmm. You didn't forget to book the axe tonight, did you? No, I've got it here. <laughs> <laughs> what? When they moved to BBC Two, they tried, you know, they actually wanted to do something way more ambitious and much more akin to the kind of Python way of doing sketches out and about and then studio stuff. Um, and even a nod to two Ronnies with a lot of the singing and dancing. Like a shrimp in a suitcase laying on a window ledge. Like a pair of tan slippers and they're underneath a hedge. Like a Despite enjoying a decent budget, Smell Of never quite broke Reeves and Mortimer into the big time the way the BBC hoped. The next assault on the mainstream was At Home with Vic and Bob, an all-night Christmas special in 1993. The strand that jumped off the screen was Shooting Stars. The, the quiz in, the big, in Victory's Big Night Out Live 
the, the questions were all impenetrable. Who's got the largest meat harness, Cliff Mitchellmore? Or the, you know, they were just, it was all nonsense, but very funny. And so we thought, well, you know, if we make it half proper quiz, half Vic Reeves' big night out quiz, it might actually be broadcastable. Wendy, Patrick Moore was the first person on television to swallow a fly live. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. Correct! Oh. Well, <laughs> That night, I think we just sort of tried to do a, quite a straightforward quiz, I think. Yeah. It fitted into that, that evening with Vic and Bob. And, uh, and it went down very well. So well, in fact, that the BBC commissioned the first series of Shooting Stars in 1995 and inadvertently changed the TV panel show forever. The Beeb felt this format could introduce Jim and Bob's unique brand of silliness to a wider audience. So, Jim and Bob put together a team of trusted allies from previous productions. The first recruit was producer Alan Mark. Welcome to Shooting Stars. Welcome, whoever you are. They asked me uh, to get involved, and that was kind of a deliberate attempt by Jim and Bob to broaden up their appeal by, you know, doing a, a kind of on the face of it was a quiz, um, but it was completely sort of perverted by their sort of style of comedy. Also back on board were two Smell veterans. Charlie Hickson continued as associate producer with the occasional on-screen appearance and stage manager Mark Mylod would direct, leading on to duties on The Far Show and ultimately Hollywood. But it could all have been so different when in the first production meeting, Jim and Bob voiced concerns he might be too inexperienced for the job. I just kind of paused a bit and said, no, no, I think I should direct it and looked down at my page and made imaginary notes for about five minutes while my face burned scarlet. Um, and they didn't say anything. <laughs> um, they were even worse at any kind of conflict or, you know, <laughs> than I am. Um, so they just didn't say anything, so I just carried on and started directing it. While Mark Mylod was learning directing skills, Ulrika Johnson was being promoted from pilot team member to series team captain. It wasn't her talents reading the weather on TVAM or presenting gladiators that led her to shooting stardom, but getting gotchaed by Noel Edmonds. I asked them why they thought of me, and actually Jim said that he'd seen me doing uh, a Noel Edmonds gotcha Oscar, where I was completely set up by Noel Edmonds and I took it very seriously in a chat, and, and they found it very endearing that I took this competition, this challenge, so seriously, um, and then was found out, and they thought that I dealt with it so well, and they thought... But Bob said that he saw something in that which sort of made him laugh or made him maybe see something else that nobody else had seen, whatever. So it's just all kind of the luck of the draw, really. Denise, can I just check... Why me again? Is your microphone working <laughs> all right? <laughs> Is it all right? We always used the women who were involved in virtually everything we do. As, like, we're a pair of schoolboys and we're too pathetic to chat them up, which we followed through all the way through Shooting Stars. So it, get, it gives it all a kind of soap opera feel. It's not working. Yes, well, let's well, attend to it. Just, just shout. Sit down! <laughs> Sit down! <laughs> it's yours, Ted! It's yours. Yes. Get off it! Try, try yours. Bob was always, you know, like insulting Ulrika, but you knew that he quite, maybe he quite fancied her. Is that true? Well, Ulrika. Yeah, you know, that, that's what you were doing with her, isn't it? Yeah, I did fancy Ulrika, yeah, all right. <laughs> <laughs> they had their beauty, now they needed a comedy beast, and stand-up Mark Lamar became captain of Team A. That's absolute crap, and you know it. No. We were doing something at Teddington. And it I'm, was the word, wasn't it? It was the last ever word or something. Yeah, the word. Because he was on the word, and yeah. he said he was out of a job now. I said, well, why don't you come and um, work for us? Lovely Mark. Have you uh, been doing... No, anything? whatever it is. No. Lies, <laughs> lies, 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 lies. Jim and Bob quite liked the idea of getting a sort of an acerbic, quite grumpy stand-up involved, who they could kind of work against almost rather than with. And... Um, Mark Lamar um, was on the circuit being, you know, quite the sort of gruff type of guy he is. Hi, Fifth is greasy, grease ball Mark. You said it. <laughs> yeah, you said it. <laughs> they said, would you be involved in the show and we'd like you to sit there and, you know, if you want to be funny, you can be, otherwise just moan at us all the time. Mark, do you want to go? 
Take it off him. Go on, give it a mark. He'll have a shot. We're not scientists over these things, you know, like, uh, I remember we, we, we saw Matt at, um, doing a try-out stand-up or something like that, and he was very, very funny, Matt Lucas, who became uh, George Dawes, just said, well, you're for, why don't you want to come and do this? It's good fun. Matt Lucas had previous form with Jim and Bob after appearing in The Smell of Reeves and Mortimer at the impressionable age of 21. But Matt was already a veteran, a true child of TV. Matthew, you've got a question. Yes, what was the worst punishment that you've ever had for not doing your school homework? Hey, there's somebody missing now. It's the man with the scars. It's, it's Georgie Dahl! Dahl! Well, the name George Dawes came from uh, Jim and Bob, definitely, and they wanted me to wear a nappy. And I put my foot down and I said, I don't want to wear a nappy on television. Um, I'll wear a blue romper suit, and it came and it was pink, so that is compromise. Um, and uh, they just gave me free reign to do whatever I fancied doing, which was very generous of them. Hands and faces. Hands and faces. So, hands and faces. <laughs> and arses and things. <laughs> and we could go five months and leave with ten! We were in the studio next to Top of the Pops, and the, after the show, I had to make the journey from my dressing room to the studio via the corridor where Top of the Pops was filmed. And I just remember doing a shooting stars show and then, and then coming uh, back towards my dressing room and this kind of 15-year-old girl just looking at me and going, looks attractive. Welcome to shooting stars. Welcome. In no time at all, Jim and Bob adapted their unique style of comedy into a looser yet more accessible anarchy. The results of this simultaneous dumbing down and sexing up can still be seen today on the nation's building sites. It's ladies' night! <laughs> <laughs> ladies! Ladies! Vic! Oh. Yes, Vic, yes! Oh. <laughs> ladies! Ladies! <laughs> I think the one that sustained best through all the series is, was probably um, Jim's leg rubbing, stroke, um, is, what's the word, lavaciousness? Lasciviousness. Lasciviousness. To me, you know, like me being lascivious towards one of the lady contestants, who was always placed on my right for that very reason. So we'd say, who are the guests? And, like, you might have two ladies, so we'd decide which one would be the one that would get the leg rubbing treatment, which, incidentally, came from... Um, I got a take... When I was doing... When I was with Island Records... They gave me a tape of some demos that people had sent, and one of them was this old bloke who was singing Christmas songs, and you could hear him going, like, rubbing his trousers mm. as he was singing the songs to the um, children. Mm. So, hey, Santa's here, and he's brought the presents. <laughs> Russell, this is your question. <laughs> Jim and Bob's mutual love of the absurd found a natural home on Shooting Stars. The shining example of this being the club's sing-around. I really don't know where the club singer came from. I think we uh, probably just did it one day, mm. didn't we? And then uh, we thought, that, that's, you know, that's quite a good, good little game to try and work out what the what I'm singing. We were on tour and we were um, we were coming around through Leicester and we were listening to local radio and there was a bloke on there and he was going he was going it's a dove. Do you remember it was something like that? Do you know now we say I remember some and we yeah. thought it was hilarious. And the dove from above round provided shooting star's most enduring catchphrase. <laughs> we were going through a period, I think, when we liked... Uh, it was a bit of sort of mythical history, wouldn't it? And it would be the Temple of Ishra and stuff like that we'd be yeah. talking about. So, um, Irano and Uvavu were just sort of like mythical, maybe slightly African-sounding names, which didn't mean anything. Boff! 
Mr. Frank Bob. Hi. Hi. And if you were a guest, taking yourself too seriously was exactly what Jim and Bob were hoping for. Can I say something before you ask me the, the question? Is that allowed? Of course you come for it. I I've got this marked as an intelligent program. And you're right to do that. <laughs> And I do wish my name was spelt like that. <laughs> it would save a lot of trouble. Well, that's how it is spelled. Boff. No, it's B O U G H. Frank Boff was a good one. We misspelt his name. We spelt it as B O W F, as in the yeah. fart. Yes, yeah. And uh, but he pointed that out quite seriously. If it was a, if he was a, if it was a comedian, they would have like it would have kind of flowed a bit. Mm. But the fact that he pointed it out, you've misspelt my name. Really, sort of, that was a high point. I think for me. Danny. Yes, yes. Do you want to say hello to your wife? Yeah, sure, yeah. Well, go I... on, but don't be long. <laughs> <laughs> you see, it's not so much a game show, we're more stooges in a sketch. That's what exactly. It is. We're course. stooges in a sketch. That's it. No, you're <laughs> stodgy. <laughs> there was nothing worse than somebody trying to be funnier than Jim and Bob and actually breaking their cycle of, of comedy that was going on between them by you know, interjecting with something wacky or funny. It was better just to kind of you know, sit there. Really? <laughs> but just sitting there wouldn't always save you from being chosen to play the dreaded end game, a weekly changing final humiliation devised by Jim and Bob. I'm just inserting the celery, Lisa. <laughs> if you can come, she's going to it. No, that's it. No, that's it. No, we're on. Here we go. She's gone for the hummus. She's got. She's gone along for hummus. Now reverse. Now reverse. reverse the 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 it was always a thing. Was was just. Sitting, watching it, and for a second every time you think, look at, look at that little tableau. There's Lisa Stansfield with celery between her legs, and a dog following her, <laughs> eating, <laughs> yeah. trying to eat the, the residue off the celery. The show's huge success coincided with the exuberance of the mid-90s loaded generation, and with one giant gulp, Ulrika Johnson was transformed into the very first ladette. Are you, are you ready, Ulrika? I'm ready. To down that pint in one, let's have that clock ready, and here's the Lagathon challenge. Go on, Ulrika. It was just something she could do. In fact, if anyone had a skill, we would try and exploit it. Did you hear what about that glass of beer? Will you ask Ulrika? Shall I tell you, it wasn't a real pint. It was a third of a pint. It was a dummy glass. I dispute that. I'll have my lawyers talk to you of your lawyers about that. Yeah, the glass, the pint, um, pint glass was um, not entirely a pint. Gone. Wow. Do it. It was a fake glass, but there was three quarters of a pint in there, which was like took quite a lot to to down. We're giving away a big trade secret now. Everybody's disappointed. The TV studio had become Jim and Bob's playground and they cheerfully broke all the rules of grown-up panel shows, including the hosts knowing which camera to look at. I'd endlessly point out during camera rehearsals, OK, Jim, this is your single camera, Bob, this is your single camera, and they would just forget it because they didn't really care. And actually, kind of, that was half the fun and I didn't mind playing the headmaster to that because... They kind of needed to be naughty boys. That was kind of part of the game. Do you know what? We, we used to have... I had a shoe on the top of mine. You did, yeah. And you had a hat on yours, didn't you? So, because uh, they'd say, well, you're on cam camera one, and that's in your, and Bob's is camera two, but we couldn't ever remember that. So I, we had a shoe, a plastic shoe on one and a hat on the other. So we knew then. <laughs> 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 you wouldn't believe what he's just done. <laughs> Because they, they don't like to rehearse too much, because they they, they feel that it takes the spontaneity out of uh, the whole show and the process. But that's kind of, I feel, sort of part of the charm of, you know, the whole vibe of what you get from when you watch one of their shows, you know. It looks like a couple of guys having a lot of fun. Um, and they did. The show was a rating success, and in 1997 won the BAFTA for Best Light Entertainment Programme despite fears when it started that a friendly rival would steal its thunder. We were up on the same night when Friends launched on Channel 4 and we were just thinking, oh, my God, you know, this is... Who knows what's going to happen here? Luckily, I think it went... One, on, one show was on, a, you know, half an hour after the other one and so we, you know, Friends was building this audience on Friday nights and, and in a way, Shooting Stars would benefit from it because uh, people were just flicking from one to the other. And uh, so the first series started around two-ish, two million, the usual reason what an audience, and gradually started to build and build and build, and by 
the end of the third, I think they were, you know, four and a half, five, you know, and, and you know, you could see the sort of graph going that way. Big ratings means power in television, and Jim and Bob's newfound clout meant as long as they delivered on shooting stars, they were allowed to experiment with other programme ideas. In 1997, they started with It's Ulrika. Jim and Bob went to the Montreux TV festival or something like that, and, an and in an interview, Bob blurted out, yeah, and we're writing a show for Ulrika as well. And he says, I don't know why I said it, I just thought it was a good idea. Sadly, It's Ulrika was savaged by the press but it did feature the first on-screen teaming of Matt Lucas and David Walliams. Jim and Bob had two more cracks at the BBC One Saturday Tea Time audience. Families at War was shooting stars meets the generation game and lasted one series, despite featuring a boy fighting a shed. Randall and Hopkirk Deceased, a remake of the 60s show produced by Charlie Hickson with episodes directed by Mark Mylod, also dropped dead prematurely. Randall and Hopkirk maybe didn't do so well as everyone was hoping and then uh, and after that experience they were keen to get back to doing their own kind of you know real trademark stuff house on fire <laughs> what kind of house tell us house bang bang it's reeves and mortimer for bbc2 in 1999 proved their talent for surreal comedy was still alive and kicking as they returned to the more familiar terrain of the sketch show instrumental version of the series sparked and crackled with their trademark lunacy a lot of the uh, real diehard fans think that bang bang it's reeves and mortimer is one of their you know the pinnacle of their um, sort of sketch activity and uh, you know it's a great show to work on by the time Bang Bang was in production, Charlie Higson, along with previous Reeves and Mortimer alumni, Simon Day, Mark Williams, Paul Whitehouse and Mark Mylod, had departed the Vic and Bob Academy for The Far Show and Comedy Immortality. Undaunted by It's Ulrika, the Swedish lager fraud returned to host high-profile events like The Great Big Election Programme, The Royal Variety Performance and scored 12 points for fluency in the 1998 Eurovision Song Contest. Alors regardez plus attentivement encore le concours car ce soir pour la première fois la plupart d'entre vous pourra voter pour, par téléphone pour la chanson que vous souhaitez voir gagner. Boy. Boy. <laughs> Matt Lucas hung up his romper suit and became a regular fixture on BBC Choice on Sir Bernard Stately Homes in 1999 and cementing his partnership with David Walliams on rock profiles in the same year. My friend Francis here. Oh, shut up, George! She does. <laughs> I don't! She does. I don't! She does. Didn't I fancy him? Just said I'd do him. But shooting stars refused to lie down, and a mixture of sentimental camaraderie and hard-nosed business sense saw the show return in 2002, first on BBC Choice, and then reaching audiences approaching four million on BBC Two. We had this break, and one of the things we noticed was that the BBC kept repeating the show, and it kept getting good viewing figures. And people I'd meet in the street kind of still thought we were making it. It wasn't just a good earner. Matt Lucas loved the format, too. I remember kind of haranguing Jim and saying, come on, let's, let's do some more shooting stars. This would be really fun, because we were just hanging out together and I hadn't seen much of Jim and Bob for a few years, and we were just all having a laugh. And I said, come on, let's do this again, let's do this again. But shooting stars Mark II saw changes to the production team and the quiz teams. Hello, I'm Mark Lamar, and this is Nevermind the Buzzcocks. The Mark Lamar was by then doing yeah. Buzzcocks, and so he didn't feel right going back to doing shooting stars. So they drafted in... Uh, uh, Will Self and, and Johnny Vegas to sort of live freshen up the lineup. I'm prepared to be there for you even when you do wet yourself, which is frequently, <laughs> let's face it. Sometimes it's no joke and sometimes it's because I like to. Okay. <laughs> Very rapidly what I found out when I began working with, with Jim and, and Bob was that they didn't want me to be myself. It was a kind of, you know, anti psychotherapy in that way, and that they were determined to impose upon me this persona so that I could take up this team captain role. And you know, their perception of me was that I was kind of you know, viciously erudite, this kind of know-it-all who was full of arcane words. Now then, Will! Hello, you chilly torrent of drivel. <laughs> you know, I kind of fiercely resented that and, and felt undermined and very distressed and, and often would leave the set weeping, uh, you know, I self-harmed. 
uh, I developed bulimia. Um, it was really quite tragic. <laughs> I've the rock, say no big surprise. You are going to sing us a song, Johnny? And permanent guest Johnny Vegas' booze-fueled rants meant that in terms of unscripted anarchy, Jim and Bob may have finally met their match. I mean, it's difficult because... You tell Johnny, can you keep a rant down to 30 seconds and it's impossible to go on for 30 minutes. Dun, 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 dun. First they say they want you. <laughs> say how they really need you. Occasionally it would in, in, almost inspire mutiny where he was rambling on for so long, Jim and Bob couldn't interrupt him or stop him. And um, Ulrika would just get bored, get up, walk out, go to the toilet, come back. He's still talking. And, um, you know, although the end result, when he edited it down, people wouldn't really tell, but some of those evenings were just incredible because it was just sort of madness. Next round is the Clips round. We're going to show both teams a clip, and they're after... <laughs> While not reaching the ratings heights of the earlier series, the show performed well and gave Matt Lucas the perfect platform to experiment with new looks and characters, some of whom would go on to become very familiar indeed. Thank you very much. One of the happiest moments in my life was um, uh, going into the, the makeup room while we were filming Shooting Stars, while they were recording, and getting into this costume and makeup and getting ready to perform George's song, which that week was, was Peanuts, which was a piece of music that I'd written, an instrumental, um, and, and then I was just going to shout Peanuts out at various intervals, which is that, is, that is a good idea. That is a really good song. And what happened was I put this wig on and these glasses, which enlarged my eyes. Peanuts! Peanuts! <laughs> if you look at the show, you can see Jim and Bob's shoulders just doing that the entire way through. They couldn't stop laughing. And after we recorded the song, the director said to me, oh, we'll go again then on that, will we? I said, no, absolutely not. That's what Shooting Stars is about. That is funny. You don't need to do anything else to that. Let's move on. It, you, can't, you can't get better than that. <laughs> I was creased up laughing. I couldn't stop. And, and Matt knew that I was laughing behind him, so that, so that made mm. him crease up. Peanuts! 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 <laughs> What's the song about? Bad Peanuts! <laughs> all right, all right. The thing about Peanuts, of course, is that wig and that glasses uh, were, were then uh, the inspiration for Andy uh, uh, Pipkin in Little Britain. Oi! Oi, Davros! Oh. <laughs> He's poor here, isn't he? And since its first TV appearance in 2003, Little Britain has become the most successful comedy show of the past decade, entertaining audiences of over 9 million viewers. The ongoing success of Shooting Stars continued to give Jim and Bob license to experiment. Jim flirted briefly with reality TV, appearing on I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here and Celebrity Most Haunted. But it was forming pet productions with Shooting Stars producer Lisa Clark that signalled their intentions to be media movers and shakers. However, an early outing, the star-studded monkey trousers on ITV, caused few ripples. Right. Just get on with it. She's dying. You're in love with her. There's some funny material in it, but I think probably the truth is maybe the show lacked a bit of heart because it was so many, so many different people. It didn't like have an identity. It, and because we, Jim and I were writing it, so I suppose it's yet another one of those examples of us find, trying to find um, almost a format where people will accept our humour. Search. Catrick was something that we've been, you know, we wrote it as a film a long time ago, and. Uh, it sort of took a long time to actually come to fruition. I've got a surprise for you. You follow me. Right, horse. Nice one, yeah. Chris, I can't follow you if you don't move, can I? You'll have to move. Catrick's, I think Catrick's fav my favourite thing, whether it's the best, but it's my favourite thing. I think it's... Um... Smashing. Super. Super little show. The rest of the team have not been idle either. 
Will Self is a novelist, journalist and TV pundit with a movie in development. Johnny Vegas has exploded onto our screens in everything from Midsummer Night's Dream to Sex Lives of the Potato Men. Ulrika Johnson is a columnist for the News of the World and a full-time mum, while Alan Mark's comedy career continues with the animated Pope Town, Matt Lucas providing voices. Now one question has a special prize attached to it. Should that be your question, you will hear this noise. <coughs> <laughs> Shooting Stars was Jim Moyer and Bob Mortimer's greatest success, and its legacy is a total reinvention of the traditional panel quiz show, as well as having provided a safe and secure training ground for a new generation of comedy giants. That's something that I've learnt from Jim and Bob, which is actually not having that much fear of failure and seeing failure as an inevitable consequence of um, uh, success in comedy. And um, I really, I felt like I was an apprentice you know, uh, at their comedy workshop, you know, and, and I learned e virtually everything I know from them. It's a, you know, it's an, I, I think it's an environment that, um, that, that, that me and Jim, Jim are good at in the studio, behind a desk, messing around uh, with a format, you know, so... <clears throat> I'd like to do it again. I like the dancing, and the, you know, the last one, uh, the last series. Dancing. Didn't you play an organ and I did a little dance? <laughs> oh, I'm, yeah. Do you know what I'm like? Well, you love doing that, don't you? Oh, yeah, don't put yes. a tash on us. Yeah, yeah. Yes, you quite right. Yeah. <laughs> Over a decade on, Shooting Star still sparkles with an effervescent madness that, to date, has had no equal. And at the heart of the show's success, the friendship between two of the most deeply and defiantly silly men television has ever seen. We still make each other laugh more than anyone else does, as it were. It still still get a sort of kick out of um, writing the stuff, and you know, like uh, it's, a, it's a, I think it's a big. It means a lot to both of us if the other one laughs at what we say. Okay, okay. Team B. <laughs> here's your. Oh. <laughs> oh. Yes. Yes. Do you know what, from the, the first moment I met Bob, I don't think anything's really ever changed. It's, you know, we've, we've never had a harsh word to each other, ever. And uh, I doubt if we ever will, you know, we just, we just get on without, you know, we still like the same things, we still laugh about the same things. And, you know, nothing's changed. Yeah.